Jimmy Harris, the director, uh, came across this, uh, my novel, was J James Woods was in a bookstore and apparently picked up a copy of my book, uh, liked it, read it, and then liked it, and, and asked him to, uh, to buy it for him. When I read it, I, I knew that this was the kind of story I wanted to do. Uh, what appealed to me about it was that, uh, that I could tell a story where there's, we could explore the fine line between the uh, cop and the criminal, uh, that they live the same kind of lives, their obsessions are the same, they're, they're, they're tunnel visioned about the, pro the capers or projects that they're on, and uh, they meet many of the same people. So I wanted to demonstrate that in, in, in this film, and, and I think that uh, Jerry's book uh, actually uh, was the perfect example of how to tell the story. Coffee. I have it here. We can do it in a minute. There you go, man. Two burgers, two coffees. Six bucks. Cedric, how's it been, man? I'm good, man. Thanks. The style of my books relates to the style of usually the way the movies turn out, which is noir. Till Van Die in L.A. and my other uh, novels have, with the exception of a couple of political thrillers, have been, w w would be interpreted as film noir or noir books. James Harris, of course, had done The Killing with Sterling Hayden, directed by Stanley Kubrick, which is a, a very famous film noir uh, piece. Um, so our two uh, ideas of the way we kind of look at the world in a very cynical way sort of uh, coincided. Film noir really is when you don't have uh, uh, heavies and heroes uh, exactly as the way they've always been defined in, in normal films. Uh, have anti-heroes, uh, you don't always have happy endings. Maybe there's even a look to the film where it has a, a it's lit in a way that it, it's more uh, mysterioso or it's showing sort of the seamy side of life. But again, I say it's, it's, it's not a cognizant effort on my part to, to be stylistic or to try to strive for a film noir look to the film or feeling of the film, it's just the way it comes out. Regarding the, the title change from the, the novel called Money Men to Boiling Point, I think it was a good idea because I think Money Men is a boring name for a movie. I think it was okay, but I don't even think it was that great really for a book, not as important. But for a, a movie really has to indicate some sort of action and, and I, I thought Boiling Point was actually a good, a good call. And they wanted to sell it on the basis of the cop who's reached the boiling point with a big gun in his hand so that he's going to explode and shoot a lot of people. They thought this was a great way to market the film. The film, of course, wasn't shot this way and it wasn't telling a story this way. It was a more esoteric piece about the difference between the cop and the, and the, uh, and the criminal, which was very little. There was no difference between them. And uh, the, the whole story was going to demonstrate. The difference between the, the uh, book uh, and, the, and the movie was that there was some, uh, the character development that was added in was an emphasis on this um, idea that um, cops and crooks have similar lives and do similar things and date the same women and so on and so forth. Their relationship with their women were, were pretty much all the same. They were misunderstood, that they were obsessed with, with what they do, they, could, they couldn't uh, satisfy their women uh, and uh, the arguments would ensue. And uh, I thought if you just made it seem like one conversation, and it seemed to work, and the audience has always seemed to respond favorably to, to that section of the picture. Oh, it's you. Yeah. Listen, I just want to see JC for a minute. Are you serious? He's been asleep for hours. Hi, Mona. What the hell are you doing here? I just thought I'd stop by, now that I'm out. I heard the bad news. So what do you want? What do you mean, what do I want? I just got out and I came here. Doesn't that mean anything to you? Yeah, trouble, which I don't need. Now get the hell out of here. I, I wish there was more in the picture I could have done that with, but I couldn't do it with dialogue, but I did it with, with um, Wesley and Dennis having seen the same uh, a prostitute. Physically, their paths would cross, even though Wesley was, was trying to find 
the killer, which was Red Diamond, or the guilty party. So I was making the point that their lives were very much the same. You saw that John that I was with before. Yeah, from a distance. What does he have to do with it? Well, that's how it all started. Turns out all he wanted was someone to go dancing with. You know me, anything that bleeds. The Wesley Snipes character in the movie would have been Charles Carr in my in my novel, uh, Money Man. So he would have been a, a, a treasury agent uh, who was working in Los Angeles investigating counterfeit money. The character in the book was based on kind of an am amalgam of characters uh, uh, that I first met when I went in the Secret Service. One of them was a guy that had always been a bachelor. Uh, was a heavy drinker, used to hang around Chinatown in L.A., and was truly one of the world's great experts on catching counterfeiters. He, he was my mentor, and he taught me the ropes. I, I used a lot of his characters and other characters of guys that I work with and people that I looked up to in my early days as a Secret Service agent. Jimmy Harris asked me if I would come down and, and be a technical advisor on the film. Uh, and I was actually there uh, for virtually every day of the shooting. Uh, he wanted to make it uh, realistic. Well, he was the most helpful, actually, when I was staging the scenes. Uh, I would look to Jerry to, uh, to define exactly what the actors would do in terms of their physical movements, if they were pulling guns or pointing guns, how to deal with their weapons. People always uh, will do uh, stories about these uh, hired killers and all that sort of thing, and, and they're paid uh, $80,000 or $50,000, and they, they do things for big mafia deals and all that stuff. The real killers in the underworld are sort of like subhuman people, and they'll kill, kill someone for free. They'll do it just to show off for someone. Uh, I knew of one case where someone was going around killing people for $500. So if you gave him $500, he would go down and kill people for you. And that's real life. And so Ronnie in the, in the book and the Viggo Mortensen character was based on that kind of a guy, a guy that if you set him and tell him something is a good idea for him to do, uh, he has no conscience and he'll do it. You know, I noticed when he went down, he had an ankle gun. I mean, if I hadn't done him, he would have done me. Right? You did exactly the right thing. When I found out that Vigo was cast and delightfully as my boyfriend, uh, I was really excited because I was already a huge fan of his from having seen his work in Indian Runner. And I was such a big fan actually that my boyfriend at the time was, um, was so, so threatened that I was working with this guy whom I was such a huge fan that when I came home from work that I, we worked at Union Station, I came home to a house full of flowers and, <laughs> and presents. He's afraid I was going to leave him for Vigo, which I didn't do. The locations that we used uh, in, in the movie were, were I thought were great. Uh, one of them, Union Station, which has been used in a lot of film noir things, was I know Jimmy Harris wanted to use it, and it was really tough and expensive to get Union Station, so we had it for all night, and we had to finish all the filming there this one night. And this was a scene where the, um, there was a, a sale of counterfeit money, and it's supposed to be a ripoff engineered by Red Diamond, and they, the, the guy that has the money is going to get shot and then run over by a car. So we're standing here in the middle of the night, and everyone has, has been working 15 hours a day on this movie. Everyone's tired, and we had a special guy come out and tie a dummy down to the deck, and then you'd, you'd film it three different ways so it looks like somebody's getting run over and they had gun experts and everything else to make this all work and it had to work in the Union Station that night because otherwise we're out of there. And so a guy backs out of the, of the parking space to run over this dummy to make it look very lifelike. He backs over the dummy, speeds away, and the dummy sticks underneath the car and drives away and the dummy disappears. And I looked at Jimmy Harris and he looked at me and we started laughing so hard that we, we couldn't stop laughing for about a half hour and the whole set broke down. 
you have to take into effect that, that pictures have to be distributed, distributors have real concerns about lengths of film in some of Christine's scenes that, that were either written and not shot or shot and not in the final cut uh, were unfortunately dropped and, and uh, she's, she's a terrific actress and, and uh, I would like to have had have more of her character in the story. In the book uh, the, the, the Ronnie character's uh, girlfriend uh, had, a, had, a, had a bigger role. She eventually was the, was the informant in the book and played a bigger role it, it, as it was in the, in the movie. She was just, it was just sort of a, a character development scene. Vigo um, was a huge champion uh, of my cause when they cut the stuff that I had to do in the film out. And again, it, we, they cut it even before I got to shoot it, so I didn't have the satisfaction of even you know, being there on the set and doing that stuff and having, and, and, and later having the disappointment of having it cut out, it cut out before we even shot it. Which maybe is comforting on one level, because it wasn't that I was no good <laughs> that I got cut, but, um, but he fought very hard to get the stuff put back in, and I think partly because I was so excited to be involved with the project, and, um, and because I think it gave his character added dimension that he was um, concerned about the absence of. I think he really liked the, the, the way his interaction with my character fleshed his character out. I did not have final cut on, on this film, although I did edit the film with the editor all the way through. Uh, what actually happened was that there was pressures brought to bear by the distributor and, and the financiers in wanting the picture shorter with a faster pace, more emphasis placed on the Wesley Snipes character uh, uh, than on the Red Diamond character. Wesley Snipes was put into the movie uh, because he came off a couple of big action movies that I think they were trying to build him as a star. His, uh, his part in the movie, I, I, I'm not sure uh, whether, uh, how popular it was with, with the audience and, and how it, how it, it struck uh, uh, people and the critics uh, weren't overjoyed about it. Um, it, was, uh, it wasn't exactly his kind of movie. As far as being a film noir movie, which requires a lot of character development, uh, that really wasn't his forte, and I'm not, I'm not so sure that that he felt comfortable in the movie. I just wanted to say goodbye. That's all. That's all. Where are you going? Any place except Newark. I'm turning in my badge. Just like that? Yeah, just like that. I had scenes uh, that ran a little longer with with the Red Diamond and scenes that he did with Valerie Perrine. Uh, I thought were beautifully done. And Dennis even, even said to me that when, after we had finished the film that he thought this was his best performance in any film he's ever done. And uh, probably was a little disappointed when he saw the final cut and that a lot of the, the performance was trimmed. Uh, which I, I, I feel, uh, uh, I mean it's painful for me to see some of that not in the film. Although people who, who, who've never saw it to begin with won't miss it. And uh, the reviews and the response to the film has been very good. But um, I, uh, as all directors, you know, there's the certain things that you'd like to be have back in the film. And, and uh, I think the film would have been better for it, even though people would give me an argument saying that nobody's going to know the difference. I think it should have been marketed as a, as a noir piece, a sort of a smarter noir piece and not a... I think it was marketed as an action movie, and I don't think it can deliver on that front. And I think that... The, vet, the merits that it did have, or does have, um, were never discovered by people that would be into those particular qualities because they would avoid an action movie. I'm not a salesman and I'm not a merchandiser or, or, or a marketeer or, or whatever. And uh, so you trust those people who are professionals at doing it, even though in the, in the back of your mind or in your heart you're feeling that they're making a mistake. So you don't have the audience that it's meant for in the room and you got disappointed people in the room who want a big, you know, shoot em up action thing, cop at his boiling point, and it isn't really what, that's not what the film's about. You know, I think it's a better film than that. It's a shame that other people can get their hands into the cutting of a film. For my purposes, I thought that uh, this film had some of the uh, scenes uh, in their original length would, would have been stronger. I'd like to spend some time with Dennis Hopper again because Dennis, I think, was, was so much fun to work with. We got along so great. And when he left the film, when his, his work was finished, we put our arms around each other and said that this was like the greatest experience we've had. He, he said that to me. 
And it was such a shame that when he saw the final film, he was disappointed in how it was edited. And I was embarrassed, really, because I couldn't control that. And I, I someday would like to, to meet up with Dennis again and, and explain him, you know, man to man on what went wrong with the performance that we had envisioned. Someday we'll, we'll have a drink together and, and kick that around. <laughs>